So welcome to our speak. It's on. Is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. So welcome, welcome to our speaker series event featuring Gregory Castillo. Um, same thing as usual. If you're going to ask questions at the end, please, we'll have two people here on the side that will be able to have mic. They'll have mics, and you can ask with the mics because th this is being recorded. If you have a cell phone, please turn it off or put it on vibrate. Uh, besides that, enjoy the uh, enjoy the show. And we're pl privileged today to have a young man named Gregory Castillo. Um, you know, working here at Miami Dade, one of the one of the things that you really enjoy is seeing people's um, people as they grow. And as I've been able to see Gregory grow since I've known him for about what, seven, eight years now. Mm -hmm. Seven years, right? Eight, almost eight years. And uh, I remember the first time I met him um, at Kendall campus in 2010. Uh, the newspapers had just been all um, consolidated or you know, become one newspaper. We had three student newspapers, and I remember meeting him with a group of other students, and he always stuck out because he was like very energetic. He was kind of like a puppy, short. He's you know he's short and and stocky, and he's always energetic. He's always moving around, and um, and I, I started asking some of the students, "Who's this guy? He's always like so so peppy. What, what's what's his deal? Can we find out a little bit more about him?" And then you know he just kept little by little he kept being more involved and more involved and more involved. And uh, as time went on, you know, he started, I think during his time here, he shot uh, photos of three presidents, if I remember, um, Clinton, Bush, and Obama, right? Correct. And he also got to shoot a lot of other events, uh, whether it was features. Um, he was a big part, instrumental, when we had an issue here back in 2012 or 11. There was a, a collapse of a uh, parking garage at West Campus. And we were out um, on a trip uh, to Orlando, I believe. And Gregory is one of the folks that was left behind here uh, on campus. He didn't travel with us. I forget why. And um, Gregory got to shoot all of those photos from that event. It was a very traumatic, serious event that happened here on campus. I think four construction workers were injured. Uh, and Gregory was a big part of that. And he was part of us in our shift to, um, to starting to shoot videos. Um, and also, like I said, his photography was great. He won a big award here. Which I know he's very proud of, and I'm also I always kid him about it because we always talk about our awards and how we make our awards seem like they're bigger than they are. But this is actually a very impressive award. Um, Gregory won a first place in the country, not just community colleges, but against four-year schools uh, for a photograph he took of uh, Dwayne Wade, I think it was right, or LeBron James, LeBron James, and that was a very prestigious award for him to win because it wasn't just two-year schools, which is you know that's that's great. But he actually competed against four-year schools and was able to win this award uh, several years ago. Um, he's gone on and he's done internships at the Miami Herald. Uh, he worked at the Miami Herald as well. Uh, he's interned at the Dallas Morning News, at WLRN. In fact, I think twice at Dallas Morning News. Surprisingly, they had him back for a second time. <laughs> um, and Greg is a, an excellent cook, and, and he'll talk to you a little bit about his, uh, his, his latest endeavor. He started a side company he has now. Uh, which I'm sure will mushroom into something bigger. Uh, he gave me a little sample of the croquetas that he's doing uh, on, on our way from the airport. Um, I'm sure that you will find him engaging, charming, interesting, uh, br very bright young man. I said I'm very happy to hear he's, he's engaged now. His fiance is here, Jessica. <laughs> and like I said, um, working here, our, our, my biggest joy is, is seeing kids develop, and he's a young man now. Uh, he went from being I think when I first met him, he was 18. And uh, if, when you'll hear Greg, Greg will pretend like he's 50. I remember him talking to high school students uh, a year after he had been here. And uh, he started off by saying, um, you know, I remember when I was your age. I'm like, Greg, you were their age like a year and a half ago. Um, but he's done a lot, and I think he's a very interesting character, definitely someone for you guys to kind of emulate or at least extract things that he's done and get some great ideas. And with that said, uh, Mr. Gregor Castillo. I remember when I was your age. And uh, now, good morning, everybody. So I'm Gregory, Manolo has said it. Uh, I actually wrote a lot of stuff on my phone. So I'm gonna read off my phone a little bit and I'll go off. I don't wanna talk for too long. I wanna let you guys ask some questions. Um, but so my name is Gregory Castillo. And you may be wondering why I'm here this morning at the Journalism Speaker Series, even though I'm the multimedia producer at the Dallas Museum of Art. And that is because I've been bothering Manolo for three years to let me do this. So thanks, Manolo. Five years, five years. Sorry about that. So, um, so what I want to talk to you guys about a little bit is uh, a few years ago, I was a, a student, the reporter. 
And it's been about four years since I was a student. And the main thing that I want to say is that everything that I did at The Reporter took me to where I am right now. I, I remember the, the, the first big thing that I did, Manolo and I were, he was giving me a ride home because I didn't have a car when I first started off at the newspaper. And um, Manolo uh, was driving me home and we saw smoke coming from the airport. We were leaving the downtown campus. And I, of course, had my camera on me because I always had it on me because I was annoying that way. And I said, dude, do you, do you see that over there? Is, there? is there smoke? He's like, yeah, I think so. So we just started driving, we started driving, we started driving. And uh, we saw that the uh, airport was on fire. And we thought, well, we gotta, we, gotta, we gotta get some photos of this. And I had just met the editor, uh, Pat Andrews, who used to work at the Miami Herald. She was the breaking news editor. And we went over there, we got some photos. And those photos became the first clips that I ever had in a newspaper in the Miami Herald, which uh, was the proudest moment of my young journalism career. You know, As a student journalist, the, 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 the local city paper, that's, you know, it's the shining star. It's where you want to work. Um, and you know, having my camera on me that day, having that opportunity come up, but being ready for it was the most important thing that I took. So uh, a little bit about myself. I was born in Hialeah, Florida. I'm 25 years old, and I'm currently the multimedia producer at the Dallas Museum of Art. So my career has changed a lot. I've done a lot of things in a little bit of time. So after the reporter, I, uh, I, I got an internship at the Miami Herald, which turned into a part-time job for about two and a half years. I'd then go on to the Dallas Morning News to be a writing and photography intern, and then I would come back to be a photography intern entirely. Uh, in between that, I was also an intern at WLRN. So my you know, experiences have been very different overall. I, I wrote, I shot, I did radio at some point. But again, coming back to why, why I'm here today, everything that I learned and everything that I've been able to do, I learned at The Reporter. I remember the first video I ever cut up, I made for The Reporter, and we put it on our YouTube page, and it has maybe six views, I think, at that point, because nobody was watching our stuff. But it was important. It was important, because now at my job, I'm cutting video every week. I'm shooting video every week. I'm making audio tours. I learned how to record audio when I worked at WLRN. And one of the prerequisites for my job was audio. I had, uh, for, if I'm correct, for my job, there was 211 applicants. And because of everything that I learned at The Reporter, I got to be the person chosen for that job. So I think it's important to learn a lot of things. I think it's important to come in here and have an open mind and really care about what you're doing and enjoy it, right? But most importantly, it's, it's, really, it's really the care that you put into it, the dedication. I'll never forget the, the first night that we worked uh, on deadline at The Reporter. It was, it was crazy because I worked at The Catalyst and, and I remember we would work for a couple hours and you know we'd rush to get it done. But at The Reporter, the work was serious. We were shooting photos until the last second. We were taking, uh, getting everybody in the room to copy edit the briefs that we would print out and everybody would try to catch mistakes and some stuff would still slip by. But we, we all worked together cumulatively as a team to make it happen. And it was, it was exciting and, 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 and riveting and, and different, you know. Um, my experience at The Reporter, I will cherish for my entire life. It's been one of the most fun, and it was one of the most fun and engaging and difficult, and we got into arguments, and we fought, and nobody always, you know, everybody thought they, they, they were right, and other people thought that they were right, and you'd argue with them, but nothing was better than being in that newsroom, the hundreds of hours that we spent, and, you know, the countless, countless things that we learned. So that's, that's, you know, cherishing that college journalism experience, cherishing that high school journalism experience is, is everything, is everything. So um, I'm actually gonna move over so I can show some photos real quick and I can talk a little bit about some photos. So I'm gonna move over to the computer for a sec. Mind you, the computer's a little slow so I might have a little scrolling issues and I just wanna talk about a couple photos and how they were made and these are, so this is my personal portfolio. Can you guys see the, the photos up here? I don't know if the, uh, can you guys see? Are the lights a little bit? Yeah, good. Better? All right, sweet. So I want to talk a little bit about some of these photos that I had. I wish I had like music playing in the background or something, right? <laughs> Manolo, can we get an acoustic guitar <laughs> anyway? 
Could you play some acoustic guitar for us, Mr. Bo Manolo is actually a very talented acoustic guitar player. If you guys don't know this, no, he's not. I'm just kidding. But um, <laughs> so I want to talk a couple about some of these photos and what goes into them. And what I can tell you is that every one of these photos, these are these, this is my best work. This is everything that I collected from my journalism career. Um, I learned how to make these photos at the reporter. Every time that I would shoot, like, so this is uh, one of my favorite. These are some of my favorite photos that I shot. This is when uh, Southern Methodist University won. Uh, they beat Tulsa to grab the conference championship. This was in Dallas. Um, and these guys were just showing so much emotion. And it was so raw. And the, the moments between these guys, they were so happy. Because this is the first time since, and I think, Manolo, you can confirm this, SMU had the death penalty, right? The school had wasn't allowed to do like conference play. So this was the first time that they were able to go into the NCAA tournament, I think, in a long time. So these photos really captured these student athletes as they won, what they did, um, how they felt. And I can tell you that I learned how to shoot these images. I got these images on the cover of Dallas Morning News. And I did that because I used to shoot every single Miami-Dade college basketball game, every single one of them. I didn't take for granted the ability to learn to work and to put my time into it. If you, you can ask Manolo, I used to carry my box of lights around and I would set up all my lights that I had from the reporter, these really old lights that we had, and I would set them up in the different corners of the basketball gym and I would light it and I would just play with it constantly, 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 changing it. Most of the photos weren't that good. I can be completely honest. My basketball photos here weren't always that good. I miss photos. I wasn't ready for some of the moments. But because I did that, I was able to capture images like these. I was also able to grab one of my favorite uh, photos, um, which is what's going to bring me to my next point about photojournalism and photography. It's just being ready when you don't expect to be is, is important. This is Richard Jefferson. He was a forward for the uh, Dallas Mavericks. So what do you guys see in this photo? What can you tell is happening? Anybody? Emotion. Why do you think that? And what do you think he feels? Pain, right? So the ball had just, he, he had a foul called on him. And he, they lost the play. The game was close. They actually ended up losing this game to the eventual NBA champion Cavaliers. So this was a regular season game. But in a moment like this, you can always make a great picture. You can always grab a little extra from whatever may seem like nothing. Because this was a dead ball. There was nothing happening. But I decided to keep my camera up. I always had my camera up, and that's, that's something that I learned from my editors, and that's something that I learned from Manolo, and that's something that I learned from just the process of shooting. And I think I have some more photos here that actually kind of show that. I should have some photos. Sorry for the noise. All the way back to NBC. Like here. So this is just introduction. Cool photo of LeBron. Just warming up. I don't know if you guys know this, LeBron used to play in Miami. It was actually, it was a pretty cool run. But, um, you know, th just trying to get moments that weren't normally, uh, you know, that you're normally not looking. So I think one of the best photos that I had of that was uh, taking a photo of LeBron James from the back, right? Now, normally, you'll be told in photojournalism that you take photos of people right in front of them. You got to get the, the subject, you got to get their face, you got to get them in line. But this photo, I, I remember when I made this photo, I thought about it and I said, huh, this kind of stands out to me. I really like the light leak. This is a real light leak coming from the top. It, it almost vignetted him, you know, completely. I played with the contrast a little bit, but it's barely edited. So this photo actually ended up going in the cover of the sports section when LeBron left Miami, uh, of the Miami Herald, that it's kind of him turning his back is the way that some people saw it. And it ended up making that moment. But again, it's another photo made not when, when it didn't need to be made. It's a photo made when you don't necessarily need to shoot it. Most people would just wait for him to turn around. But that's an important thing that you learn. You learn to, to shoot when you, when you least expect it. So that's uh, another photo that I like. Uh, one of the biggest assignments that I ever thought changed a lot for me uh, in photojournalism, this is when I was at the Miami Herald, I shot a playoff high school football game during the day. And I had never shot football during the day. Because usually you shoot football around like, six or seven o'clock and it's dark and it's hard to shoot. Football's hard to shoot. And this was just a regular playoff game. We just needed one or two photos, but I decided to not approach it this way. I decided to approach this game 
as a story because this is a playoff game. And a playoff game, everything's on the line. These young men worked all year to get their, their, their craft done, to play their position well. Um, I don't know a lot about American football. Manolo knows that, so he joked around with me that I always sound like Eddie Murphy in Coming to America. Um, uh, the, the, the yellow team defeated the white shirt team. Anyway, but I took, I took this game, this playoff game, as a story. And I wanted to express the, the sorrow of the losing team as well as the joy of the team that won. So you can tell. What, what, what side of the, of the score is this gentleman on, you guys think? Zach, right? So he's upset. You know, right here, young man is being consoled. I got close to these guys. I could have, I could have left. I could have left. I didn't need these photos. I didn't need to shoot these photos. But something told me to stay, and that's making a story. You can approach every assignment, even the smallest assignment that you have in your high school newspaper, in your college newspaper, at the Miami Herald or at the New York Times. You have to think of it as a story. Everything, even the smallest thing. The joy that these young men have that they won, you can see it. You can see screaming, the passion behind it. It's, it's, it's you know. I mean, it, the contrast, generally, um, this is one of my favorite photos, is just the contrast of this. Like, we won. Y'all did it, you know? So, you know, that's another, um, that's another moment that I really like. And another, you know, I, 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 this was a big moment. Like I said, this, this game was big for me. This, this showed me that everything's a story and every moment is important. And you can capture that, and it's your job to capture that. Because these people felt something, and it's something that hurt. It's something that was, was happy. It was a sad moment, and it was a happy moment at the same time. There's two sides to it. Yeah. And capturing both sides of that is important. Another couple photos that I really like. Um, oh, look, there's a Spanish guitar music instrumental open in the cab <laughs> over here. I'm just going to play that in the background a little bit. <laughs> as we oh, we can reset that up. That was, that was wonderful right there. So I, I actually didn't set that up. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that. That was actually <laughs> <laughs> so. A couple other. Uh, I want to talk about uh, a couple more photos. This one of my favorite photos that I took. This was a feature photo. There was an electronic music uh, concert called Life in Color. I don't know if they still have that. It was in. They do, right? Um, and I went and uh, this giant dude in a bunny suit got in my face and was like, "Yo, I'm in a bunny suit." <laughs> so I took his picture and you got the stage in the back and everything. I actually have a funny story from this. My uh, is Nick. Nick, you're back there. Yeah. So Nick, Nick is a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist from the Miami Herald. Incredible man, great dude. I see a couple of smiling people over here, like, oh my God, Nick Mohammed. I know that's him. He's my, he's my friend. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so this editor that we used to work with at the Miami Herald, his name was Roman Lukowski. He was my first real photo editor ever. But nice guy. And uh, he he goes to me, and uh, you know he's an older gentleman. He's like fifty something, and he tells me. Gregory, uh, I'm going to have you shoot this EDM music festival, I think it's called. And there's going to be Steve Aoki and Chains 2. <laughs> and I was like, wait, 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 wait. Did you just say Chains 2? <laughs> so it was 2 Chains who was actually there. It wasn't his like, rip-off Hialeah guy, Chains 2, which is my rap name. Um, but uh, this is just another moment that I loved. I was standing around. This bunny came up to me, and I was like, yo, I'm going to snap a picture of him. This ran Metro cover. So, you know, making, making the most out of any little thing. Uh, during my time at the Dallas Morning News, I shot a lot of sports. I shot a lot of features, right? This is one of my favorite photos that I made um, at the Dallas Morning News. And the reason why is because I saw these kids and they were having so much fun, right? They were having so much fun, especially this young lady here. You could tell that she had probably never been on a roller coaster before, or she had just started. You know, it was at one of her first rides at, at this, um, this festival. It's called the Mayfest Festival. And we just needed a quick feature photo to run in local. It wasn't a big deal. So what I did is that I got on that roller coaster. I sat right behind her. I wrapped my camera around my wrist, and I, and I kind of just put it out and just shot until I got something that I liked. And I asked their family, of course, because I didn't want to be some weirdo and just be like, just showing up and shooting your kids. Like, sometimes you actually kind of got to ask. The best photos are usually candid moments, but you will learn later on that sometimes you got to kind of tell people what you're doing because you might seem like a creep if you don't. So, um, so this was another important moment. Another good photo for, for, this was a daily. This didn't need to be, you know, I could have just taken a photo of some people having fun, but you, you go the extra mile. I learned that from Manolo. 
I learned that from my editor Laz Cameo, who's at the Washington was at the Washington Post. He he was the first uh, graphics editor of the reporter, and he designed the first reporter. And he always pushed us to really make the the content spectacular. So that's another thing. Another couple photos that I really love are um, I love this photo simply because it just shows the joy of eating cupcakes, and I think we all know that that's how we all feel when we're eating cupcakes. So that was important. Um, just trying to get uh, another, uh, in a more technical side, how many photographers are here? How many people are interested in photography? Got a couple, right? So light, you shoot for light, right? The, the same way, I don't know if you guys have heard, chefs cook, right? The way the chefs cook, they, they find the best ingredients and then they make food based off those ingredients. You don't come in with a preconceived notion of what you're gonna make, the ingredients dictate what it is. Sometimes light is that same ingredient and you shoot based on light. What I love about this photo is that A, this young dude has two samurai swords, so it's already a winning photo for me. But I love the light. I love that there's a natural light from a window clearly coming from the top. I like this young man over here in the dark, you know, telling him that he can't fight him. I don't really know what was going on really. I think it was a Ninja Turtles run that they had. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but light, light is an ingredient, and you have to use light uh, effectively, but you also sometimes get lucky and you find light. But always think of light as the constant that is fueling your images, that is making your pictures. The way that you're making pictures, you find the best light. You can't make pictures without good light. So that's one thing. Uh, another couple photos before I wrap it up. Um, shooting concerts is fun, um, but shooting sports was my bread and butter. I love shooting sports. Um, the thing about sports is that you just have to be ready, right? So you're always looking. This dude was flying, and he caught this, you know, this pass. He probably gained like 75 yards on it or something. It's at Columbus. Um, yeah, I believe it was Columbus versus uh, Belenja Suite, which is a huge game every year. Um, people get a little too passionate about Columbus versus Belen, by the way. I just want to throw that out there. I mean, I saw, like, Dad screaming at other people, like, you got to do it. I'm like, yo, he's 15. Like, <laughs> relax. <laughs> Uh, another moment of just joy, right? Like, when you're shooting daily features, this was at the fair, actually. This was just at the Miami-Dade fair. What do you normally think of when you see the fair, right? You go, you shoot the roller coasters, you people eating fried food and stuff. But what I, I went and I was just looking for joy, right? Because when you think about the fair, you think about joy, you think about happiness. And, you know, you got to look for emotion, too, right? The same way that light's an ingredient, emotion is the other really important ingredient in photojournalism, right? So, these are some of my favorite photos. Um, let me just see if I have any more that I want to kind of show. Um, and I'm going a little slow, but you know, during my time, uh, during my time at the reporter, Manolo was talking about the West Campus garage collapse. Um, this was a big moment for me. Uh, I was at home, and everybody was on this trip. And I was totally bummed out that I wasn't on this trip. I don't remember why I couldn't go. I think I had to work that weekend. I had a part-time job at that time. But I ended up staying, and I get a call. I was in the shower, and I saw my phone ring, and I was like, dripping wet. I grabbed my phone, and it's like, Manolo's like, you need to get to the West Campus because a parking garage flew out. So I ran there naked. I, I really, no, I'm just kidding. But, um, but I got in my car, and I drove like 95 miles. A police officer stopped me. I told him I was shooting the news. He let me go. I was very lucky that day. And because of just being there, just being ready, even when you weren't ready, I was able to get these photos. I actually didn't have a telephoto lens that day, so I had to ask a photographer from the Miami Herald to lend me his lens. Really great photographer who actually passed away um, earlier this year, Hector Gabino lended me his uh, Canon 70-200 to zoom lens, and he let me get a photo, and it was about as close as we could get, but that ran in the cover of the reporter, and it was another important moment. Um, and it was an important moment also about camaraderie, because journalism is a small field, and there's not a lot of people, and it used to be really cutthroat. I actually had lunch with Nick yesterday, and we were talking about how the, the Miami Herald used to be this really ruthless, cutthroat place, and now everybody's friends. Why? Because there's like 18 people left, so you've got to be friends with people, you know? Um... But uh, during my college career, I really, I made it important to figure out things that I didn't know. So I was always really interested in studio life. And what I learned now working at an art museum where I'm the only person that shoots events and people and videos and makes audio tours, I learned that um, I know nothing about studio life. And I'm 25 years old, I've been doing photography since I was 15. 
and I thought that I knew, but I don't. I started studio light, learning studio light here. I see these photos now, and I'm like, oh, the highlights are totally blown on her forehead. This basketball's totally blown out, this and that. But um, you learn about, you, learn, you, you keep learning even no matter when. This is the photo from the fuel farm fire that I had mentioned. Um, this photo ran on, in the Herald. It actually didn't make it to print, I think, but it made it the next day. Um, and, you know, we got it in there, and, and I got paid for it. Shout out to money, because, <laughs> nope. Um, but, um, you know, that's another thing, too. I know I'm going to kind of sidestep a little bit. Get paid for your work. Your work has value, whether it's writing, whether it's video, whether it's photography, even young. People are going to try to get you to do unpaid internships. Uh, people are going to try to hire you for, for things that are below what you're worth, and you got to do what, what, what you're worth, you know. The reporter was important, and, you know, we didn't get very much of anything money-wise or anything, but it was important because it was the learning platform. But once you've learned and once you've established yourself, you have to give yourself that, that value and you have to really put, put yourself in the shoes of a professional because no matter what, you may be an amateur, but you know, you're working on it constantly, you're working towards being a professional and you have to get paid for that. Um, I've photographed four presidents, um, one of them being President Trump when he was still uh, just dude Trump um, of The Apprentice, and uh, I, I did almost all of these at uh, The Reporter. And to be a 19-year-old kid who photographed three presidents was a cool thing, and the opportunity was never lost on me. The, 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 the privilege that I had was never lost on me. So last week, I actually, uh, George W. Bush came to the Dallas Museum of Art. And he was touring our Frida Kahlo, Mexico, 1900 to 1950 show. And he walked in, and I've never been a fan of his politics, but I've always known that he's a good man, that he's a, he's a very kind, sweet man. And uh, he came up to me, and he immediately went to shake my hand, and I shook his hand, and I said, Mr. President, I've uh, photographed you two times before, twice at Miami Dade College. And he said, uh, I said, once at Miami Dade College, once at your, at your center. And he said, <laughs> It's an honor. <laughs> so he gave me that. So as he was leaving, though, I took some photos of him with some of my coworkers. He actually asked. He, he turned the camera around. He gave it to my friend. He said, he pulled me in. He put his arm around my shoulder, and he said, Brad, it's about time you and I took a photo together. And I was like, I'm not Brad, but thank you, Mr. President. So um, the last thing I want to talk about, uh, and I'm going to just kind of scroll down a couple photos. Here, there's W down there. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is, uh, and I told Manolo this, and, and the reason that I think that me being here and talking to some of y'all is important, um, because I am not currently practicing journalism, right? I'm not a, a working journalist, but I work at the Dallas Museum of Art, and the way that I see it, I am the photojournalist of the Dallas Museum of Art. So I'm going to try to pull up some of the uh, photos while I'm talking about it. Um, your skills that you learn here and the skills that you learn in the reporter, and the skills that you learn in your journalism career are vital and quintessential and important, and they will take you to places that you cannot even imagine, and they will take you to things that you can't even imagine. If I had a That's So Raven moment, and I flashed forward, and I saw that I was working at an art museum as a photographer, I would have not understood that at all when I was starting at the reporter. But I get it now, because these skills translate, and these skills can take you to do things that you didn't imagine. So right now at the, DMA, at the DMA, I'm the multimedia producer. What that means is that I'm in charge of audio tours. I'm in charge of shooting all the videos that we make in-house. I shoot all the events pretty much, and I will shoot uh, installations, turnaround for the press. I will take photos of as much as I can um, for the museum. I document the museum daily. I document the people that come to it. And I, I know that no other candidate would have approached the job the way that I do. Because the way that I think about it every day, and the, the, when I go take photos, um, when I take photos at the museum, I, I know that I'm documenting as a photojournalist. I'm documenting moments that happen. I'm documenting people's emotions. And I'm documenting every way that I did as a journalist for the museum. So I'm going to try to pull up this flicker. So this is actually a hidden flicker that we have that we don't completely publish, but you can kind of go and, and see some of the images that we make. Um, and I want to talk about one assignment specifically that we get to do every year. Um, it's, uh, we have a, Jessica, what is it called? Uh, the, uh, uh, with Emily? Tour. Yeah, thank you. It's a vision impairment tour, tour, right? So one thing that when I got to the museum that I knew is that, you know, when you work in journalism and when you leave journalism, 
a lot of people that that leave journalism, they they I, I can tell that they feel like they're betraying the craft or they're betraying you know the, this this very honorable profession because it is journalism in this day and age is one of the most honorable fields that you can get into if you're doing it the right way. If you're doing it like Mr. Nahamas or anybody at the Herald or at the New York Times, these people that are trying to keep politicians and the public, you know, informed and keep politicians accountable, right? And I, it was hard for me to leave journalism. It was hard for me because I felt like I was, I felt like I wasn't being the good guy, you know? And I, I always felt when I was doing journalism that I was the good guy. So um, leaving for the museum was difficult, but I accepted it. Um, but the good thing about the museum is that I still feel like I'm batting for the right team because something like this um, event that we have every year, we bring these uh, young, young people who have vision impairment um, and with vision impairment, I've learned that with vision impairment comes a lot of different, um, different um, developmental issues, right? So for these folks, they come in here and they start, they, we make them feel special. They get to touch the sculptures. They get to touch the art and nobody gets to do that. So this young man right here, um, I'm forgetting his name right now, but as soon as I walked in and he saw me with my camera, he came up to me and he grabbed my hand and then he hugged me and it was awesome. So throughout the entire time that I was with them, the whole two hours that they were visiting, I kept letting him grab my camera and take photos. And you know, he, I could tell that for him and his, uh, his sibling, it was a really, really tender moment. It was a sweet experience and they felt special and they would keep coming up to me and give me hugs. This is Emily who actually puts on the event uh, at the museum and she does this every year. This is such a, his name is Eric. Eric was such a sweetheart. And I approached this, I approached this event like a photojournalist. I said, I'm gonna shoot from every angle possible, I'm gonna try to get photos from every which way, and I'm gonna show off what these folks are here for and what they're doing. And every year that w I've done this, the twice that I've done it, it just, it feels special, it, it feels different. This is the one, one of the events that, that I, I love doing just constantly because I know that, that these young people are really feeling like the museum gives them a place and that they can, that they can be together. Um, I love this photo, just because everybody's just themselves in this photo. So, um, as you'll see, they start to, to interact, they start to touch some of the art. You know, these two, they were, I just missed the fist bump. Um, always have your shutter on servo. If you're a photographer, just shoot, 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 don't stop. Um, but, you know, this is a really, I'm having a little trouble moving through the images, but it's just a little frozen. But anyway, events like this, you know, not journalism, but my journalism skills are still being put to use. I'm still photographing the same way that I did when I was in the newspaper. I still care about it the same exact way. I'm still looking for light. I'm still looking for different angles, and I'm trying to get images that tell the story. These, these kids came, and they had fun, and they felt special, and they felt, you know, as normal as they possibly could. You know, whether they're blind or they have any sort of developmental or cognitive disabilities, they still came in and they were a part of the museum, and I got to photograph that. So it's a real pleasure uh, to do so. So what I want to leave you with is that your journalism skills are important. If you are following journalism, if you want to be a journalist, do it, and do it because it's important. And right now in this country, it's more important than anything to keep our public officials accountable. Um, but not everybody's going to end up being a journalist, and if you don't, Know that the skills that you pick up here, know that what you learn in the reporter, know that what you learn in your high school newspaper, and whatever type of journalism training that you get is going to translate, and it's going to take you further than almost anyone else. All the people that I know that, have, that were journalists that ended up going into a different profession are the best at their profession, and that's just the fact of the matter. So um, thank you for having me. If you guys have any questions, I'd love to answer them, and uh, yeah, thanks so much. Oh, so uh, also what in yes. So those are two things that I forgot. So um, first, I'll start off with. It's funny that you bring those two specific events up. So I, uh, when I worked at Dallas Morning News, one of my last assignments, there was a uh, contest to draw the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and if you guys know uh, anything about Islam, it's generally very frowned upon to draw the Prophet Muhammad or to illustrate the Prophet Muhammad. And these um, very right-leaning. Um, folks had this contest to draw the prophet, and uh, I was I was assigned to shoot it. Now, 
there, there was knowledge that that might be kind of a controversial event. We all knew that. They had hired a lot of armed security, and it was a very, very, very controlled type event. There was a lot of police and a lot of off-duty security officers. So I shot the event, and normally when you're shooting, especially for a newspaper, when photos are running at night, you have deadlines. I had a deadline of about 8 o'clock that I had to get my photos in, about 7 o'clock usually. You can go a little later, but that was about my deadline. So I, I finished shooting photos. I got photos of people drawing the profit. Show, really, they were showing off their art, and people could bid on it. And there was a lot of very like right-leaning um, celebrities, almost, at the event. Um, so I, I, I finished shooting, and I leave the main hall. It was at a conference hall in Garland. And uh, I leave, and I start to get on the Wi-Fi to upload my photos, as you normally would. Right to through the FTP or whatnot, and um, the Wi-Fi doesn't work. I had no Wi-Fi. I, I was totally boned. I couldn't get my photos in. So I called my photo editor guy at the time, credible photo editor who really helped me a lot. I said, "Guy, I can't. I can't get these images in. The Wi-Fi is not working." I, I didn't have one of those wireless cards that they give you. Um, they hadn't given them to the students, to, to, to the interns. The regular journalists had them, but the student intern photojournalist didn't have them. Um, so he said, "Well, just go go upload." From somewhere I live pretty close I live about 20 minutes away so I decided to leave so I go home I'm uploading my photos and I get a call from guy and he's like what's going on over there and I was like I'm watching everybody loves Raymond mm -hmm. and he's like you need to get back to that place because there was a shooting so two um, you know alleged oh, at this point I, the gentleman passed away two two men showed up um, and started shooting at people with uh, a uh, AR-15, I think, you know, an assault rifle, assault rifle of sorts, and they started shooting at security guards. Luckily, they were the worst terrorists ever, and they didn't hit anybody but a dude in his, like, foot, and uh, they were taken down by some police officers. But because I left, because I didn't upload my photos where I should have, and I didn't have the tools to do it, um, I missed out on being inside and possibly being getting images of people locked up that would have gone everywhere. Those photos were everywhere. They were all over. You know, the AP ended up buying images from some just people that shot with their cell phones on the inside. But if I had had the ability to stay, I think about it every day. If I could have been in there, I would have had those photos from the inside. If I had Wi-Fi on the outside, I probably would have still been there. I also could have gotten shot, but that's, let's not talk about that. Um, but it was, it was an important moment for me to realize that as a person, you know, we have our tendencies, right? And that was a bit out of my control. But um, you're going to want to go home a little early from events. You're going to want to not get the extra quote or whatever, but I regret every day that I didn't stay there. I wish I had just taken some more photos for another 30 minutes and then gone to upload, you know? Um, because, you know, events like that are, you know, things like that are once in a lifetime. Even, it was peaceful. It was peaceful the entire time that I was there. There was no problems, but I wish I had stayed. So, um, that's that. Um, as Now, as far as Manolo's other uh, question was uh, Donald Trump. So in 2012, Donald Trump was having, I think, a political fundraiser in his Doral, um, uh, I think it was 2013 actually, in his Doral golf course. And I, uh, I was assigned to go take some photos of uh, Miss Trump. And I, at that point, was a big fan of The Apprentice. Um, not that big of a fan. But I like The Apprentice. And I didn't, all I knew was that Donald Trump was this rich dude. So I get in there, and I want to find the picture, but it's like on Facebook, and I have no idea where it is. Um, but uh, Mr. Trump comes out of a room, of course, surrounded by Ivanka and his sons, and uh, he sees me, and I have to get a photo of him. I po take a posed photo of him, whatnot, and uh, they all pose, stand outside in the dark. I guess they thought that photos are good in the dark outside for some reason. But... Um, when they went back in, Donald was walking in, and I was walking right next to him, and he sees me, and he sees this, he has this gold Har Harley Davidson motorcycle, which is literally the most Donald Trump thing you could ever imagine. He has a gold <laughs> motorcycle with his logo on it. And uh, he, he, he says, how about I sit on the motorcycle for you? And he sits on the motorcycle, and... Uh, <laughs> And I'm not a journalist anymore, so I can say stuff like that. Um, but um, he sits on the motorcycle. He gives me a big thumbs up. And he says, that's going to be the cover of the Miami Herald tomorrow. <laughs> I called my boss, and my boss was like, we are not running that photo at all. <laughs> that photo only lived on my Facebook feed and for uh, telling stories like this.
So uh, if I can find the photo, I'll try to pull it up. But uh, I would love to take any questions that y'all have. So. Hello. Um, okay, so Hello. as <laughs> as a photographer for the reporter, I think it's always been easy for me to um, introduce myself. Um, you know, under Wait, the. I'm gonna turn off. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> that I, I I'm actually playing that song. I recorded that. No, I'm just um, so it's always been less intimidating for me to introduce myself as a photographer under the reporter, um, whenever I'm taking photos of people or writing down names. Um, <clears throat> But do you have any advice for, you know, if you're just trying to build your portfolio as, um, you know, not under a certain organization, um, and you're, I guess I find it a little more intimidating when you're introducing yourself to people as, you know, oh, I'm just a photographer trying to build my portfolio. So do you have any advice for that? Um, if you're trying to build a pho photojournalism portfolio or just a general photography portfolio, like photojournalism. So what I would say is do what I did, and it's milk the reporter as much as possible. It, you are a photographer for the reporter, and you can pretty much make anything an assignment for the reporter, right? You could say that, like, if you, you see, let's say you want to go su shoot some sort of event in Miami Shores, right, that's going on that has nothing to do with the college. Tell Manolo, I want to shoot this event for the reporter and shoot it for the reporter. Because I will say that I think it's easier, it, it's what you said, it's easier to shoot under the, the, the coverage of a newspaper, especially a college newspaper. People are generally really accepting of it, and I found that what, what I, honest to God, did is that I shot everything for the reporter. I, I, I said that I was shooting it. I, how many assignments did I have in the reporter that had nothing to do with the college? Just photo briefs, you know? Um, because, you know, photos are, you know, remember, you're a student newspaper, but it's not, it doesn't have to be 100% of things that just happen at the college. It's things that are important to you and things that affect you. And, uh, you know, let's say there's some sort of event like that, right? You want to shoot it? Shoot it. And then tell Manolo. If best thing that happens is that it runs. Best thing that it does, the worst thing is that it doesn't. But you got to shoot it under that guise. As far as shooting for yourself uh, and telling people, I, I, just, I, I, I can't say that I really did it very much because I think it's just, it's awkward. It's awkward, you know? Um, so that's what I would say is just try to milk the paper as much as possible for your own personal gain. <laughs> um, what would you say was the thing that made you turn from writing to fo to taking photos? Um, we did everything as a staff of a college newspaper. Um, everybody had to do a little bit of everything. Um, you know, I would write, when I was the bureau chief at Kendall, I would write stories about Kendall. When I was uh, the photo editor, I would still write stories. When I was just a photographer for the reporter, I would still just write stories because I generally had an interest in it um, and really what it was is that I wasn't a good writer at that time. Uh, when I first started, I was a terrible, terrible, terrible writer. And I, right now I'm still just an okay writer. But I went from terrible to okay just because I was interested in doing it. Uh, I wouldn't say that it was a change very much, but it was just that I wanted to do a little bit of everything. And when you're in a college newspaper, you're kind of forced to. So um, for me it was just interest. It was interest and, and wanting to be a well-rounded journalist. I think that every and I've heard this from every photo editor and anyone at a professional newspaper, every photographer needs to be able to write because you never know what's going to happen. They need to be able to get an interview. They need to know who, what, when, where, why. And they need to be well-rounded. And Manolo always says that he feels that photojournalists are sharp people because you're always looking for details and you're always looking for you know, specificity and you're, you're looking out for, for things to happen at the moment. So I think that photographers can be very good writers, but I also think writers can be good photographers. So hope that answers. Was photography something that you were always interested in growing up, or did you just pick it up from the reporter? I was always interested in photography. My, uh, my father was a cameraman for Univision for 20 years, so I grew up um, taking photos. Uh, my, uh, on my Instagram, actually, from years ago, there's a photo of me when I was five years old, uh, short and chubby, which hasn't changed much. Um, and uh, there was a, a photo of me that said, uh, it was a picture, actually, what we did when we were in third grade. It said, uh, when I'm older, I want to be a photojournalist. And I don't even think I knew what a photojournalist was back then, to be honest. But I knew my dad was one. So, you know, it was something that I always wanted to do. It was really because of my dad. It was really because of my dad. So. 
Um, what are the qualities in a photo that you think make a perfect shot? Um, I think uh, most importantly, it's light and emotion. Um, those are the two things. Framing, of course, is critical, um, but that's more technical. I think that if you can get the emotion of what a person feels, if you can get uh, the light correct, um, it makes a perfect shot. Uh, a perfect shot is also very much, you know, I think that a lot of young journalists and a lot of young photographers think about having to capture the perfect shot, but perfect shots happen. They don't, you can't make it. You know, I mean, and they happen by being ready. They happen by, um, you know, like I said, expecting the unexpected and always thinking that the next moment could be better than the last when it comes to an image. Um, I don't think that, I, I think a perfect shot happens. You can't make it. I think that's a good way to put it. So it's also very philosophical. Do you have a mental stop in the 2.8. 2.8. Yeah, I've got a 2.8. No, it's, it's just when, when you're a photojournalist, right, you, uh, standard gear for a photojournalist at a newspaper that I always had when I was at the Herald, at the Morning News, everything, it was uh, Canon or Nikon, 24 to 70, uh, short range, medium range zoom, and a 70 to 200, and then you would shoot with, uh, you know, different, whatever lenses, really, they were your preference, but those were, that's your kit. Um, so I almost, y you would generally shoot at 2.8, because most of the time, and you'll, you know, the photographers in the room know this, there's not good light. There just generally isn't good light. Even though there's a sun, there's just generally no good light anywhere. Um, so, yeah. That's the setting. 2.8. Yeah. yeah, I have uh, F2.8 tattooed on my wrist. So, I also have a Bosque pen. Any other questions? How do you go from writing for the reporter, taking pictures for the reporter to a journalism job, a paid job? Uh. That's, that's the tricky part. <laughs> no, you, you, you really, you work as much as you can in the, the reporter. You work as much as possible. And what I found, and it's, I mean, it's still doable, you know, and I know that, like Nick just talk, told me about all the new interns that they have at the Herald, and they're fantastic new interns. You, you, you have to work at getting, um, getting little by little your work into a big, bigger publication, you know? Like, even though the Herald has cut back significantly, they still, a great photo of a great breaking news moment is always welcome, always. They're always gonna want that. Something that you have is always gonna be its worth. So I went from, you know, working for the newspaper um, here, you know, to the day that I shot the fuel farm fire, the photo of the, the fire that I showed off earlier. That was, I, I, I photographed that. That got me my first connection into the Herald. Then I heard that there was a, a part-time job opening, uh, a, a temp contract job open for a multimedia producer, uh, which really what it was, was managing this horrible CMS program that the website was based on, like this horrible content management system. And I took it instantly. It, it wasn't even what I did. I just, I knew that I needed my way in. So you take your way in whatever way you can, and then you build upon that. So I took that job. I was working once a week. I worked Fridays from four to midnight, sometimes one. It was terrible, <laughs> it was awful. It was generally the slowest time in the newsroom. But because of that, I started talking to the photo editor, Roman at the time, and I started saying, hey, I'm, I'm interested in photo. So when they came around to picking interns, I was one of the first people in mind, because I weaseled my way in. My whole career has been weaseling my way into things. I mean, it really, like, <laughs> nobody wants me where I am, I just get there. Um, yeah, so weasel your way in whatever way you can. And, and work hard at the reporter so that when you're weaseled in, you can say, look at all this stuff that I've done. That's pretty much what it is. So. This guy, this guy. So um, I, I uh, in Miami, so this is not journalism related, but uh, I grew, I'm, grew, I'm from Hialeah, and uh, I grew up eating croquetas. So uh, my business partner, uh, and my wonderful fiance has supported me the all, all this way through uh, for us starting a croquette stand at the Dallas Farmer's Market um, that we thought we might sell like 60 croquetas, but we've uh, sold out every single day at least three, 400 croquetas every day that we've worked. And who would have thought white people like croquettes, man? <laughs> so we call it croquette because 
we're in Texas, um, but on our menu it says croquetas, and we have a ham croqueta, and we have a an elote croqueta that is like Mexican corn with cheese in it that really sells like crazy. Um, and we have a breakfast croquette, and then we make sandwiches out of our croquettes. And uh, oh, we have a cheese one too. It's got five types of cheese in it. Um, <laughs> but um, we we. Um, we, we, we took that. What I would say that I learned in journalism, and, and, and I know it's going to sound corny, but it's talking to people. Because most of the, they put, so when you start off at the Dallas Farmer's Market, this is a huge outdoor space. It's 100 degrees outside. It really sucks, like, during the summer. It's hot, right? But what, what journalism has done for me, what I've done with it, is that people will come up, and most people have no idea what a croqueta is. Y'all know what it is, because it's South Florida, and you eat them for every meal, right? <laughs> I do. I'm fat. But that's just my thing. Um, but, um, you know, you, you talk to people. You, you talk to everyone. And people are interested if you have a good story, right? So when people come up to us, our little corny spiel is they go, what is, what is a croquette? And we say a croquette is deep fried love, right? Why? Because it's the story. That's the truth. The truth is that my grandmother, Adefa, rest in peace, my great-grandmother, Adefa, used to walk me every day when I was five years old. Not every day. I didn't get a haircut every day. But she would walk me almost every week to go get croquetas and a Sprite from the Rosa Bakery, which would later burn down, <laughs> literally burn down and be rebuilt like a phoenix. Um, but um, so I, I grew up eating my croquetas with my grandmother. So the story behind it is what sells people. So we start to tell people, we sell deep fried love. We take our favorite recipes that we grew up eating, we roll them into a ball, and we fry them for you right there on the spot. So that's, that's Croquette, and that's how journalism has helped Croquette. So this guy. This guy, look at this guy, look at this smile. What's up, brother? Hi. Uh, so my name is Roman Negrin. I'm the photographer and now. This guy's good. I've seen his photo. This guy's very good, by the way. Thank you. Uh, so photographer and uh, photo editor for the reporter now. Um, my question is basically, how would you, or how did you manage to basically, uh, like, manage all the stuff that you did? So let's say right now, currently, I'm the photo editor and photographer for the, for the Miami Data College, the newspaper, uh, full-time student. I'm a camera specialist, part-time at Best Buy. And then uh, now during the fall, we're also going to revamp. Uh, I'm going to be the president for the photo club uh, in Kendall Campus. So how did you and your time manage to You, you pick up? what's most important to you, and you, you do that. And there's, oblig there's always going to be obligations, and there's always going to be things that you can't. Anyway. Um, this guy, Barco, <laughs> causing havoc again. Um, he set that up. He wanted to be looked at. Um, <laughs> tie clip looks great, Mr. Barco. Um, but um, no, you, you pick what's most important to you, and you, you really think about that, and you do that. 100%. And that's it. You know what I mean? Like, um, I have a buddy who, he's a musician. He's been a musician. He's been doing music for a couple years. Um, and he called me one day. He's like, yo, I just quit my job. And I was like, what? <laughs> he's like, yeah, I just quit my job, dude. I'm doing this music thing full time. And I told him that day. I said, I've never respected you more than that. Because you never know what you are fully capable of if you're doing everything 50%. You know what I mean? And my favorite quote from one of my favorite, my, from my favorite TV show ever is from Breaking Bad is no more half measures. So everything that you do is not a half measure. It's 100% of what you do. So you have a lot of responsibilities. And you're the president of the photo club. And you're the photo editor of the reporter. Well, which one of those things is going to most likely get you a job in what you love doing? Which one of those things is, are you spending the most time that you love to spend on? And whichever of those things doesn't qualify for that, you cut it off and you don't do it. You only do the things that you really, really want to do. And you might change your mind. You might want, in five years, you might open a croqueta stand in Dallas, you know what I mean? Like, again, another That's So Raven moment. I wouldn't understand how that would happen, but it happened. Um, but the most important thing is to do exactly what you want to do right now with 100% of how much effort you need to put into it to do it well, so. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about dealing with strong personalities? When you were at the reporter during your time, you dealt with some pretty strong personalities. You had Lazaro Gamio was there, who's now at Axios. Alex Diarmas was at Channel 7. Melissa Dan was at Channel 6. Um, Akeem works for a TV station in Fort Myers. And Monique Madden, who the, was the editor of the paper, is now at the Miami Herald. So these were all really pretty strong personalities. And how, how did you manage to have your voice heard? 
and make sure that the stories that you were interested in were being put into the paper? I think that um, we, you know, when we started the, the reporter and, and, you know, Manolo being the instrumental part, you know, of, this, of the college that brought us together for that, um, you know, everybody that was in the reporter that was an editor thought they were hot stuff. You know what I mean? Everybody thought they were, Alex was the best reporter. She thought she was the best reporter. And Lazaro actually was, it's actually the most humble guy on the planet. So he, he was is. literally never any sort of problem. That dude would literally do anything. Um, but we, um, we all thought we were hot stuff and everybody wanted to be the best. Akeem and I would compete constantly. You know, Akeem always wanted to be the best photographer in the paper and I always thought I was the best photographer in the paper. And the thing is, you realize though that those strong personalities, that makes you better. It makes you better. And, and those people, everybody, everybody wants the best thing. Everybody wants the best thing for the paper. They want the best thing for themselves. The thing is, is knowing that when trying to get the best things for yourself, you can't sacrifice the the time and commitment of other people. So um, I think that to deal with strong personalities, to deal with people that are a little hard headed or that, you know, are just really, really gung ho, um, you you have to have empathy and you have to care about somebody else's feelings because you're not the only one. You're not the only one. I know that I had more than my several occasions where I thought that I was the hottest thing in the newspaper because I won the award of it. It doesn't matter. That None of that matters. What matters is everybody doing their best and doing it together and pushing each other up instead of j as long as you're never putting somebody down or, or somebody's putting somebody down you're in good shape and you're doing good um, because those people that put people down they end up getting taken out um, and removed with force no <laughs> <laughs> no but you know what I mean so I say that's the way you got to work together and you got to think about other people because people want every the, the general goal right is that people want to be happy and that they want to be good at what they do so if you're doing that and you're excited that other people are doing that and you understand that they're trying to be just as good as you are, then you're all going to work well as a team. It's just about caring. Okay. Any more questions, guys? Hi. Uh, you seem like an example of somebody who uh, everything that you do, you put 100% in. And every step that you've taken since the reporter uh, to the Miami Herald, uh, to the Dallas Morning News, uh, onto the museum and now cooking what's the next step what are you going to do uh what are you putting 100 percent into right now uh maybe in the future maybe you have your own cooking show you have a great personality you know very good speaker i am very applying to be on chopped <clears throat> on food network are you? no i'm really doing it i'm actually going to apply to be on chopped on yeah. food network because i really it's my dream to win chop <clears throat> be bobby and flay the, and beat bobby <laughs> flay i was actually watching beat bobby flay yeah. last night yeah. <laughs> But no, I want to. I, I would really like to be on chop. But my my, yeah, I'm getting married. My beautiful fiance. So that's right now 100. Mm -hmm. um, we have a puppy. He's 2,000 yeah. percent. Uh, he didn't sleep last week, so he was all percent. Um, but no, we want to. We want to figure out what the next step is um, with with the croquetas because clearly people like them, and we can't keep selling out of a tent in a <laughs> farmer's market forever. So um, whatever well, we can put next uh whatever the next step for that is we're gonna figure it out but uh we found out that the machine that rolls croquetas uh it does ten thousand a day costs twelve thousand dollars so um i'm gonna go steal it from vicky bakery in north miami if i can before i leave but yeah well, that'd probably be it seems like you can sell anything well thank so, you yeah you're a very good speaker thank you brother appreciate you you're a very handsome man <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Any more questions? Thank you so much. I have actually have one yep. more thing. So can you talk about, you know, we, we talk to students a lot about covering Miami Day College sports if they're interested in sports, right? And the importance of gaining sources, getting sources. So you talked about how you would shoot every game. every You would even go to a lot of practices. Yeah. Um, and I do remember the lights. You carried those lights everywhere. In fact, I had to carry those lights mostly. <laughs> but, or Laz actually carried them a lot of times. They were huge old lights that we had. There's the worst lights. Yeah, but uh, talk to them about um, Matt Isley. He was the yeah. coach here and how the importance of getting to know every player came into play. So Matt Isley was the basketball coach at uh, Miami-Dade College in two th from 2000, like, nine to 2011 right or to, to like 2011 or something like that something he was coached for about three years and i will tell i will i'm going to start off with a positive about matt isley and then i'm going to go to a negative about matt isley 
that team was so good. And you know what I mean? Like, that was the best Miami-Dade college basketball team I've ever seen. Actually, two of those players, one of them is in the NBA right now, and he plays for the Memphis Grizzlies. And another player went to East Carolina. Actually, a bunch of those guys ended up going playing good basketball. So now I'm going to talk bad about Matt Isley. Matt Isley was a psychopath. The dude was crazy. He was the coach of the basketball team. He came in. I came in one day to shoot some practice, and he screamed at me. He said, Greg, I love you, man, but if you don't get out of here in 10 minutes, I'm going to kill you. I remember thinking, like, okay, um, I just got to shoot some photos for a brief. Like, is that okay if I do that? Um, but he was a crazy guy, and I remember I was at a game once. Um, like I said, I mean, I really I shot every single basketball game, not only because, um, because I – I feel like D'Angelo right now. I hope it's my <laughs> I, I, I shot every single game um, because I love basketball. I mean, I, I do. I truly love shooting basketball. But I almost, I almost shot every single um, volleyball game because MDC is really good about volleyball, too. And I would just do it for the experience to, 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 to put it on there. So um, I, I was at a game once, and I saw that Matt Isley wasn't there. And that was weird because the dude's a psychopath, and he had to be at every basketball game. They were going to the playoffs. It I think they went to the, the playoffs. Next is the last game of the season. Last Obviously. game of the season. And they were already, I think they were already for sure going to the playoffs, though. Um, and he wasn't there. And I called Manolo, and I was like, Isley's not, well, no, I didn't call him that. So Stephen Coward, who is a great basketball coach, too, he used to be, I think he left. Um, he, uh, I go to him, and I go, hey, Coach Coward. He was actually really nice to me. I said, Coach, where's, uh, where's Isley? And he says to me, don't, don't, don't know. What? You don't know where the head basketball coach is in the last game of the regular season to go to the playoffs? And uh, I called Manolo, and I was like, dude, this is really weird. These guys are being really odd. I see the, I saw, uh, the, you remember the uh, sports director at that T time? Tony Frienza. Tony Frienza. I asked Tony Frienza. I see Tony Frienza. I go, where's Isley? He's like, can't comment right now. I was like, what? This is the basketball coach. I called Manolo. And um, that ended up being the biggest story that we wrote that year, I think, because Isley was... Uh, I believe suspended and then removed from his job and he had an incident with a player where he said something to a player um, he it, it was a huge huge deal and um, you know he w I, I always knew he had the potential because I had heard that when we were at the, the newspaper before uh, before the reporters started Matt came in and chewed out a student and he told he got mad at a student for this, writing this a story. Is let's be clear, this is before I was here. This was before Manolo was there. <laughs> this is that when we were at the the Catalyst, Catalyst. actually at uh, MDC, um, and Isley had chewed out a, a, a student journalist just for reporting, um, or just for being around, really. Um, and that ended up being a big story. And Matt ended up being removed from his job. Um, and he he I know for years he kept contacting right to get that story removed um about him because we wrote about it monique ended up writing about it but um and i got a byline with monique on that story the only reason i got a byline on that story the only reason we did that story is because i asked where matt isley was that's it i mean that's that's you know that was the 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 curiosity i mean the curiosity of a journalist is is impeccable it's and then the other important else. thing is that greg had a phone tree he had a phone number cell phone number for every player on that basketball team yes. so while the school wasn't talking to the students he was able to contact every player and he was between him and monique they were able to find out what the story yeah. was well oh, because i was close to the guys and the thing is one thing that you'll notice as a photojournalist especially shooting sports is if you make nice pictures of people they like you People like that. People like to have their photo taken. They generally do. So, um, you know, from, from I I'll never forget um, the point guard of the basketball team. I don't remember his name, the short guy. Um, he was good. I mean, he was a baller. Dude would qu had a crossover like AI. And um, he, uh, I, I, I was shooting, I was, I was always shooting on the floor, and I was the only person shooting pretty much. Um, Sometimes media services would shoot too, but I was the only person on the floor. And uh, he scored a really nasty reverse layup, and he just got in my camera. And I was like, that's awesome. That was a great moment. And, you know, he knew me. He knew that I could make good photos. He knew that I could take his photo well. So they always, you know, those, those guys felt comfortable talking to me because I made their photo, because I hung around. And not only did I make their photo, I shot jumpers with them at practice. I didn't make them, but I shot them. Um, and, uh, you know, I came through, and I would chat with them, and I'd be like, yo, so, so who's dropping the most points tonight? Like, you know, I mean, I, I had relationships with these people. Relationships that you don't need to have, but that you need to have. So. 
Well, on behalf of the Journalism Speaker Series and the reporter. I always wanted one of these. Thank you, my man. No Thank you, man. What are those? <laughs> well, no, let's take a picture of you. I get to tell him what to do now. He's buying me lunch. <laughs> he, d he didn't know that. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. Appreciate you.